It's time to learn about limits. When we're dealing with a function, say x squared or sine of x, we frequently want to know how it behaves at a particular value of x. But we could also ask how a function behaves near a particular value of x. And that's what we examine when we explore limits. Saying that a function f has a limit l at x equals a means that as x approaches a, f of x approaches l. So all of the points in this narrow interval around a are sent by f to a narrow interval around l. This is our intuitive notion of a limit. You might ask why we've defined this notion, because it seems as if l is just the value of f at a. It's crucial to understand, though, that that value doesn't matter. We could take this graph, which is the graph of a fairly nice looking function, and change the value of f of a to l plus 1, for example. We've changed the value of f at a, but not the limit. When we're talking about limits, we care only about how a function behaves near a, not how it behaves at a. In fact, we could remove the value at a altogether, so it's not even in the domain of f anymore, and we still haven't changed the limit. This is one of the most important things to understand about limits. Formally, we just said that if the limit as x approaches a of f of x is l, and f and g are equal everywhere except possibly at a, then g has the same limit at a. Let's now turn this intuition into a formal definition. You might be tempted to start the definition by starting with a narrow interval around a, since, after all, we use the phrase as x approaches a. But this is problematic. In this example, starting at a works, since this narrow interval yields a narrow interval around l. But in this example, with a steeper line, the same narrow interval around a doesn't yield a particularly narrow interval around l. So we start instead with a narrow interval around l, and then work back to a narrow interval around a. We get a limit when no matter how narrow we make the interval around l, we can find an interval around a that's mapped by f into that narrow interval around l. Putting this in formal language, we get this definition. Saying that the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l means that for every epsilon greater than zero, there's a delta greater than zero such that the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon whenever the absolute value of x minus a is strictly between zero and delta. Note that we require that x minus a not be zero since we don't want x to be equal to a. We don't care what f of a is when considering the limit. Looking back at our example, if we start with a narrow interval around l, in other words, all the points less than distance epsilon from l, we can trace it back to a narrow interval around a. This picture is actually a bit misleading, since it makes it seem as if the traced back interval is symmetric about a. If we look at this example, it's clear that it might not be. The neighborhood around l is symmetric, but the resulting neighborhood around a clearly isn't. That's okay, though, since as long as we take delta to be the smaller of the two distances u and v, then the delta neighborhood around a is mapped inside the epsilon neighborhood around l, and that's what we really need. Going back now to the previous graph, note that it doesn't matter that we also have another interval on the x-axis that also yields the same interval around l. This happens a lot with functions that aren't one-to-one. -one. Another way to look at what's happening here is to focus on a small rectangle around the point AL, which we'll magnify a bit here. To say that the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l means that no matter how close we make the top and bottom of this rectangle, we can always find sides sufficiently close so the function never escapes the top and bottom between the two sides. But this function still looks fairly nice. What if we got rid of some more points? and then even broke off a couple of pieces and moved them up and down. The function doesn't look very nice anymore, but we haven't changed the behavior inside the rectangle, so we haven't affected the limit. And what if we did change something in the rectangle? Suppose that we change f at this point. We've changed f in the rectangle, but we can still draw another rectangle, smaller this time, around al, where f is unchanged, so we still haven't affected the limit. We can therefore extend what we said previously about changing the value of the function at a to this, which is the formal way of saying what we just described graphically, 
as long as f and g are equal on some interval containing a, except possibly at a itself, then the limit of g is the same as the limit of f. In this video, we've talked exclusively about examples where a limit exists, so you might wonder how a limit could fail to exist. We'll talk about that in the next video.